Hey, how you doing viewers? Thank you for watching. Peace and blessings to you. Now this is going to be a tough video to, to make and a tough video to talk about um, in some ways, but in other ways it's, it's not, depending on where you are, where you stand really on these things. But I wanted to just talk about um, the, the problem with the difficult passages in the Bible, and specifically what I'm talking about is the passages in the Bible where it said that the Most High, Yah, it commands people to do what, you know, do things which are frankly wrong, really. Let's, let's just put it that way. And what I want to do is to just kind of talk about one of these passages and then talk about how I kind of uh, understand these kinds of passages and more widely, if I get time, if the children don't cut in and interrupt, how I, uh, how I kind of view the scriptures more generally, really. Um, so hope you find this of interest and maybe useful. So this passage that I'm looking at now is 1 Samuel 15 and I won't read all of it. I'll just maybe try and try and summarize it. You can see it on the screen here. I'll just summarize it. Basically, uh, this is set in the time of just before King David came onto the scene and became king. And this is when King Shaul, Shaul was the king of the children of Israel and uh, Saul or Shaul is, is told by the prophet Samuel to do a thing. So basically it says here, I'll read a little bit of it. It says, Yahweh has sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, hear, hear the, heed the word of, heed the voice of the words of Yah. Thus says Yah of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and women, man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That's the pertinent point, really. Basically, the Most High Yah, it is said, told Samuel to tell King Shaul to go and attack the Amalekites and kill every single one of them. Men, women, children. Every single last one. Um, and all the ox and donkeys and get all, all the animals. Or at least ox, sheep, camel and donkey are amongst the animals. Uh, and so what happens as the story progresses, this is First Samuel, First Samuel chapter 15. As the story progresses, it turns out that Samuel, that Shaul didn't actually fulfill all of the order. It says this, it says, I'll read it in verse 7. So Shaul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is the east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Shaul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, oxen, fatlings, lamb and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed so he, King Shaul it said partly fulfilled the uh, command because he he and these people the Israelites uh, utterly destroyed all of the people with the edge of the sword no doubt what that means that means that every single last man woman and child baby was killed by these Israelite uh, attackers so the story carries on, and if you read the rest of the story, it turns out that, uh, Sa according to Samuel, Yahweh is displeased that um, that Shaul did not fully fulfil the order. And we see this in, in verse 14, when Samuel comes along and says, what is, basically he says, what is this bleating of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I can hear? And then Shaul explains, well, we kept the best of it, but we killed, we killed all the people and, uh, you know, but we just kept the best of the animals. And Samuel says that Yah is very displeased with this. And because of this, he's taken the king, he's going to take the kingdom away from Shaul and give it to someone else. So that's obviously how David, Dawood, became king. But the point here is the image that's being depicted here of Yah is that he commanded the Israelites to go and commit what we would call today a genocide, wipe out completely all of the people, men, women, children, babies, nursing infants. Now, what does, so the problem of course is, is this really what we 
is this really Yah, basically? Is that, is that how we see Yah? Do we see Yah as, or the Most High, whatever you want to call the name? Do we see him, or do we understand him, or do we, you know, is that, is that him? Is that the Most High that, who, who commands people to go and kill babies, let's just put it that way? And my answer is no. And i tell you what, one of my sort of driving forces in sort of returning to confront this is that I have children now, nursing infants, two nursing infants I have of my own. And one of my driving forces behind all of my study with regard to scriptures and, you know, theology and just everything is, you know, at some point I'm going to have to, I'm going to, we're going to explain these things to our children. And I, I cannot... And I will not sit down and say, yes, guys, the Most High God who we worship and love, he, you know, commanded these people to kill babies like you. Yeah, I just can't do it, you know. Um, now, previously, back in the day, you know, these kinds of thoughts led me to just basically give up, completely forget all about the Bible and just uh, go about my business doing other stuff. I never stopped, you know, believing in, I never became an atheist or anything like that, because for me, it's just... I've never been an atheist, even before I was an actual believer in, in, you know, explicitly a believer in God. I always believed that there was a God. You know, it just doesn't compute for me to just think that there's... But anyway, the point is that now I, I'm not going to... I don't think I'm going to go down that road. I won't go down that road. I still believe in the, in the, the God that is, dis, that is discussed in the scriptures. But my view of the scriptures is what has changed. So my view of these passages, and there are many other passages like this, we only have to go to, um, I think it's, is it in Numbers? Well, in the Torah itself, there's a, you know, occasion, the, 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 it's said that Yah tells, you know, the children of Israel, when they come to take over the land of Canaan, Canaan, the Canaanites, to wipe out everybody, kill everybody, man, women, and children. Um, I think there's a, an occasion in Numbers where we've got to the Midianites, where, Again, the same thing, go there and kill all the men, women and children and so forth. Um, this isn't an isolated thing. There's, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an overall issue. So first of all, with the, the extermination of the Canaanites, what you, really, what you find out is that although in the book of Joshua, it claims that Joshua completed the task exactly as he was supposed to and killed off all the Canaanites, you go to the book of Judges and there's Canaanites all over the place. They didn't destroy the Canaanites. They didn't commit genocide on the Canaanites. So what's going on here? Well, that opens up the door to start to think, okay, well, and this, this, this kind of line of thought comes from a guy called Pete. I, got, I first heard this kind of line of thought from a guy called Pete Enns, Pete E-N-N-S. And he basically, you know, looks at that and says, look, well, the, hist the scriptures themselves point out that on the one hand, it says, oh yeah, Joshua killed all the Canaanites. But on the other hand, the Canaanites are all over the place after the time of Joshua. So there's something going on here. You know, we, we have to interpret some of these things more than just taking it on face value, literally. And then when you look at the historical record, there's no evidence for a wipe, a massive wiping out of the Canaanites over a very short period of time, you know, back in those days, whatever it was, two, one and a half to 2,000 years before Christ. And so what we have to start to think about is, well, maybe the, depiction that is, the, de the depictions that are given there are more words being put into Yahweh's mouth by the writers of the scriptures for good reasons, for pious reasons, you know, complex reasons, but they're still putting words into his mouth. And the scriptures, rather than looking at every single last word in the scriptures as being falling out from the from the mouth of God and being divine, you know, tr absolute literal factual depictions of what happened, we have to start thinking about maybe these are depictions of Yah and, uh, and interpretations of things that happened in history through the minds of these people in that time who were writing these scriptures, in the minds of these children of Israel who were writing those scriptures. And it doesn't mean that they were lying per se, but it just means that they were interpreting what was going on around them and they were interpreting their interactions with the Most High through the lens that they had, which is their cultural lens. You know, just like all the other people at that time were doing similar things, so were the children of Israel. Um, and that's, that's 
how I've started to view the scriptures really is that rather than looking at it as this is the Bible and it is, you know, it is complete unadulterated word of God and everything in there is literally true. No, I look at the scriptures as look, yes, God has been communicating with people from day dot, but people are people. We have our own ideas, we have our own cultures, we all have our own mindsets, our attitudes, our preconceptions, you know, our minds have been conditioned by our cultures and so forth and we've interpreted our interactions with God in a certain way. Um, this comes into the talking about the, uh, the doctrine of the inspiration of scripture. Inspiration in traditional kind of western Christian thought is almost like a kind of, I don't know, like people just become like, um, what do you call it? As if God is like using you as a ventriloquist where your words, you know, are coming through your mouth are kind of just the words of God. You just happen to just be the conduit that the words came through. Almost like, um, you know, you go into like a trance, <laughs> kind of, and then suddenly you're right, right, and right, and right, and then you stop. You're like, whoa, where did that come from? All right, well, that's the word of God. I'll, I better share it with the world. Um, that's the sort of traditional Western Protestant, anyway, tr conception of, of inspiration. Whereas different concepts of inspiration have a much more nuanced uh and I think a realistic view of it, which is that people are free. People are, people have free will. We've got free will to, to decide what to do. We've also got, you know, we also cannot but speak or write through our own prism, through our own lens, through our own culture and so forth and so on. So we're going to interpret these things through that. Just so, so the concepts of, of, of God that were written down by the Israelites in say 2000 BC, are different, plainly different to the concepts of God that were written down at, at, the, at the time of Christ. Let's face it, the concept of God that you get from Yeshua and uh, Shaul, Paul and others in the so-called New Testament is pretty different to the concept of God you get, say, in some of these passages that we're talking about there. Whereas, you know, we're, we're seeing these passages saying, go and kill all these people because these people did something wrong to you back in the day. We see, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you and so on and so forth in the New Testament. And, I, and what I'd say as well is that actually even in the, talk, in the Tanakh itself, particularly in the prophets, you see a development. You see some of the prophets saying things like, does Yah actually want sacrifice? Does he want these sacrifices? You know, there's even a passage in Jeremiah. This is just a, a very quick overview. So apologies for not going into any depth. But there's a passage, a passage in, in Jeremiah where he says something like, how can you say that the Torah of Yah is with you? And he, it's, I, should, I should find it, actually, shouldn't I? I think it's, where is it? Let's have a look. I think it's Jeremiah 10. Is it Jeremiah 10? Uh, let's have a look. He says something like, how can you say that the word of God is with you? The lying pen of the scribes writes falsehood or something on those lines. I think it's Jeremiah 10. Uh, da -da 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 -da, here we go. Let's have a look, hold on. It's Jeremiah 8. It's Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8. It says, so this is in the middle of a kind of, uh, you know, uh, denunciation of the people of Israel, the children of Israel. And it, and it says here in verse 8, how can you say we are wise and the law of Yahweh or the Torah of Yahweh is with us or the teaching of Yah is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribes certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of Yah, so what wisdom do they have? So that's an interesting one. It's saying, you know, these people are saying at the time, they say, how can you say that we have the Torah of Yahweh? No, the false pen of the scribe work, certainly works falsehood, suggesting, suggesting that this is like a, maybe a bit of a reflection of how back in those days there was like a struggle going on. People were writing certain things about the talk, about the Yah, about the Most High Yah, and claiming certain things about Yah. Now, we don't know exactly what they were claiming and the, the full context of what is going on here. Obviously, people who would have read that at that time or heard it at that time would have probably known, like, oh, right, yeah, he's talking about this particular issue or that controversy over this scripture or that scripture and so forth. But it's a little interesting little hint at at the discussion and the debate that is going on 
at that time in uh you know in in amongst the children of Israel with regard to what is what is Yah's word what is Yah's teaching what are they supposed to be doing and so yeah for me I look at that and I just and, and the, the, the big thing as well you know we to sort of compare it to is a lot of the New Testament in particular, and the New Testament isn't, you know, you know, the New Testament also has some bits in there which are which which are, you know, um, in keeping with some of the sort of wrathful, vengeful depictions of Yah in the Torah, the Tanakh. So you could say the Book of Revelation, for example, you know, if read a certain way, can be looked at in that way. Um, but a lot of the Torah, the, the the New Testament, particularly the words of Yeshua himself, a lot of those words are in almost direct contradiction. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, you know, um, turn the other cheek and so forth. Um, and as I say, I think that, that that discussion was also taking place in the, to in the Torah. So to summarise this little bit, and hopefully I can carry on until the children disturb again, bless them. To summarise, what I'm saying is that when you look at these commands of saying that his commands of Yah to go and commit genocide, these are not, in my opinion, these are not actually what what happened. You know, these are these are people of probably later. You know, the, the, a lot of the scholarship around the, the scriptures views uh, the the final kind of um, what's the word the final compilation of the of the Tanakh as happening as having happening around about the time of Ezra. Uh, in the post-exilic period, so around about 400, 500 BCE, you know, and that there is where, so for example, there's a passage, I'll talk about one more other passage, there's a passage, I think it's in Jeremiah again, where, oh, and, and in um, maybe the Kings, the books of Kings, where under King Josiah, I think it is, the, the book of the law is discovered, in fact, let me find it, hold on a second, yeah, here it is. This is in 2 Kings 22. And basically, this is under King Yoshia, Yoshia, Yehoshua, however you want to pronounce it. It says, verse 8, that Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of Yah. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. Um, and then I'll scroll forward and then it's basically the book is read to the to the king and it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the Torah that is he tore his clothes and then it carries on the story carries on that um, in the next chapter in particular that Josiah does this massive um, reforms uh, where are we basically saying look we need to keep the words of this book of Torah which we've just rediscovered uh, and you know he takes out all the wooden images from the from the house of Yah, uh, burns it to the ground. Tore, see in verse seven of chapter twenty three, Second Kings, he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of Yah, where the women wove hangings for the wooden image, uh, defiled the high places, uh, and all this sort of stuff. It carries on and on and on and on. And so the idea here again is that there's a story being depicted here. I think this story was probably either written or, you know, tweaked around at the time of Ezra during the post-exilic period when they were returning, you know, to make sense of what had happened to them getting kicked out of the land of Israel. Um, they put this kind of, and maybe they were believing that this is what Yah was telling them. I'm not saying again that it's a necessary deceitful or deceptive or evil or wicked, but the narrative was being put together that, look, the reason the ways that we had were wrong and bad and actually these are the proper ways this more strict uh way of worship and this more strict interpretation of monotheism and so forth that has to get rid of all of the high places and so forth the folk religion if you like all of that has to go and then this story about a book of the law being discovered uh, and that was actually the truth and then all these big reforms that were actually done by Josiah and so forth it's a narrative meaning to justify this new way of worshipping the Ezra and that which, or this, this, this particular way of worshipping, not necessarily new, but whereas before they might have just been a sect within the various streams of the Israelites people during the kings, um, they went out after the, after the exile and then they came back and they read their version of things into the overall history of the children of Israel. 
that's what I think is happening here, in parts of it. And I think when we're looking at, so there's that, and then when we're looking at things like, you know, the the flood, the flood of Noah's time, you know, God killed everybody because of they, they were wicked, or even looking at the slaying of all of the firstborn of the children of the children of Egypt, children of Kemet, and so forth. I think we just have to see all of those things as not ne- not the not the sort of acts of the Most High God, who is love. God is love, according to Yohanan, John, the book of First John. God is love. Is that loving to just wipe out everybody? No, it's not. Men, women, and children. Is it loving? For example, there's a is it Elijah? I think prays for the sun to stand still, for or something like that for three days. Oh no, no, prays for there to be drought for three three years so there was drought for three years if there's a drought what's going to happen thousands maybe millions of people are going to die we see we've we've seen that happening over the last hundred years is that the acts of a loving god no i think these are the interpretations of things that are happening by the people of that time and so my view of scripture and when i read scripture i'm not reading it as again as literal this is all of this is definitely literal truth and so forth but I'm reading it to understand okay these are how the children of Israel at that time some of them understood what was going on let me see how I can understand the most high how I can grow and develop in my understanding of of life and the most high particularly through the prism of Yeshua himself particularly through the prism of his teachings he is said to be the image of the living God you know he is he is in the beginning was the Logos, the Dabar, the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made through him and so forth. You know, he is the express image of the living God. You've seen him. You've seen the Father and so forth. So if he is he is the, the best revelation that we've had of God, then we should interpret everything through him. So, yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at with my understanding of the scriptures and, and you know, it's, as I say, it's a very brief overview in that regards. And the reason why I wanted to put this up here is because it is relevant to what is going on around us now with this SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus COVID-19 situation. Because the question, of course, is, or maybe should have, I should have started with this, the question is what's happening here? What, where, does, where does God fit into all of this? What's, what's, is God doing something? Is God, is God trying to teach us a lesson or because those are the kinds of what uh, interpretations that you would maybe have if you view the scriptures completely literally you would go down that road because yes in the scriptures according to these writings these texts god does use disease and famine and death and destruction to punish and teach people but if you go down more the route that i am kind of going down at the moment then you have to think of a different way to interpret things and I'll just point you in the direction of a guy called Thomas J. Ord, who has th- who's got some really good conversations out there about how do we understand disease? You know, how do we understand calamity and suffering of bad things? How do we really understand these things? Where are these things coming from? Why are they happening? Is it all part of a divine plan of God? Is God allowing these things to happen? Is Yah allowing these things to happen? Is it that he could stop these things, but he's chosen for some reason not to? Or is there something a bit deeper than that? Is it, which is where I'm leaning at the moment, is it that actually the Most High can't just unilaterally change things and and, and make things happen one way or the other? Maybe he's just, you know, he works with creation in a kind of, um, in a way that is, you know, not a one-sided unilateral, he can just do whatever he wants to do and just override people just like he can't just just like he couldn't he can't just override people to just write exactly what he wants them to do but rather he works with creation and he works with you know the, the elements including ourselves and seeks to sort of you know persuade us to do what you know to to to, to learn to do the good to do things that need to be done in order to prevent things like this from happening in the first place anyway let me not go into too much detail on that one. Some rough thoughts on there anyway. Thank you for watching. I know, again, I know that this is probably way out there. Apolog- can't, somewhat apologies for causing offence to anybody, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't run a, uh, 
I'm not the leader of any particular religion or I don't have a, you know what I mean? The only leader that I am a leader of is my house and my children and my, and my wife are what's important to me. Um, and so I want to make sure that, you know, I'm putting serious thought, prayer, serious and, you know, pious thought into all of these things to, you know, to, make, to, to kind of come to an understanding which befits the most high God who, you know, to whom we owe our existence, you know, and, and if, if that causes offence, then so be it. But I just want to share. So thank you very much for watching. Peace out till next time.